repress memories and repress trauma, how can you go deeper and when should you stop digging? More importantly, how can you be sure, 100% sure, that the memory is authentic? Because it's one of these very challenging issues where you can't quite know with early childhood trauma in particular if it was a real memory, an authentic event, a tangible, concrete moment of pain and suffering and disconnection, or if it's actually our unconscious mind wrapping around confusing and often upsetting images and narratives to make sense or try and make sense of a wider undercurrent of unsafety and emotional dysregulation. I'm not going to get it perfect in regards to your particular situation in a generalized video on the internet, but in this video I'm going to try and answer the following question on the screen, specifically this final line of do you have any advice on how to remember and I need to challenge that question because you can see that there's a lot of emotional dysregulation in this question overall. It's very painful, it's deeply upsetting and for some people entirely shattering to wake up one day, maybe you have a dream or something happens where you watch something in a movie and your mind suddenly goes somewhere very dark. You're alone with a memory that you can't quite know for certain. Did they actually do that to me? Did something actually happen beneath my awareness? And of course, there's many different versions of the story. Um, for the sake of this video, I'm going to be going with the more traumatic, abusive aspects of childhood, especially those situations where parental figures did things, um, or the environment created situations where there was deep wounding and deep alienation for the children that we once were. I'm not going to get it perfect, and again, if this is a really difficult or fresh topic for you, do work with a professional therapist, get yourself off of YouTube, and actually work with someone one-to-one. -one. If a wound was suffered relationally, there's a lot of repair that can happen when you're working with someone one-to-one -one and they can give you love and attention and support and work through things in a practical way where you really get professional support. But for the sake of this video, I'll go into a few different aspects I think are most important when you're trying to learn how to go deeper and when to stop digging. We're going to be touching upon the book Trauma and the Soul by Donald Kalshed and this idea of the psyche having a self-protective defensive mechanism when it comes to trauma. That's something that we're going to go to in the middle half of this video. But before we go into the trauma psychology, I want to give you a very simple metaphor that will help you really navigate as an autonomous adult where to go and how quickly or how intensely to go in terms of your own unconscious trauma work, especially before the age of about four, which is where memory typically starts to constellate for most of us. Consider the difference between an archaeologist and a pirate with an excavator. I know it's a silly metaphor, but it's something that will really go into your mind. The difference between a classic beige shirt, explorer's hat, archaeologist with a fine brush going to a rare dig site somewhere in the world and respectfully, patiently, over many months, finding either the dinosaur bones or the remnants of a lost culture and not destroying anything in the process, versus a pirate with a full black beard, only two teeth here at the front, a parrot on his shoulder, full pirate hat, in a bright yellow construction excavator, going to the same site and pillaging your own unconscious and pillaging your memory with a plundering, take all and leave nothing behind kind of mentality. It's a ridiculous metaphor, and I know it's not fully trauma aware, but this really does capture the difference of how I advise you to go about doing repressed memory work. You don't want to be going in with that pillaging mentality. Not only the pirate consciousness of kick down the door and take the treasure, in this case it's the emotional treasure of finding out exactly what happened, but also having that construction site excavator taking massive chunks out of your memory and trying to disturb too much too soon. If you did indeed have a particularly disturbing moment in your childhood, or maybe an environment of repeated disturbing moments, just do your inner child a favor and don't create too much of a dust storm. Don't disturb those foundations, because when you understand that the psyche has a self-protective mechanism, we really start to get a new understanding of what it means to repress trauma in the first place, and how that can actually be quite life-saving and really protect our identity against future wounding.
going to bring out a quote in just a moment, but finally that archaeologist approach that I really recommend you take. If you have, for some reason, woken up one day or had a dream, read something in a book, watched a movie, a conversation with a friend, maybe even a YouTube video that you've watched, and you suddenly feel all of that dysregulation, it feels like your world's collapsing and you're shutting down and there's so much pain, there's so much agony. I've worked with clients in these spaces. I'm not a professional licensed therapist, but I'm trauma-informed enough to know that you shouldn't keep digging. Don't go too hard if it's already hard on the inside, if it's already painful and it's already overwhelming. There's a space for detachment, and this is the difference that I'll also touch upon between repression and containment, between avoidance and detachment. Consciousness can be used in a way where you can de-escalate the intensity of all of those somatic shutdown response or the fight or flight response and still go back in in the right time, but again, shift yourself towards an archaeologist with the fine brush looking through that way, and when you notice something, you see a bone that you didn't expect, you see an arrowhead in the dust of your own psyche, and that's a wound that you're going to be investigating. You don't need to yank it out, look at it, and then in that process of yanking it out, scrape yourself on the cheek and feel all of that bleeding all over again. That's why working with a therapist can be so useful, because often if we're left to our own devices, you want to go in right away, and it's very difficult to pace that journey. But that's uh, for something for you to decide if you think it's the right appropriate move for you. I'm going to bring out a quote now from Trauma and the Soul by Donald Kalsher, which I recommend you read if you really want a high level understanding of how the most soulful, most authentic parts of us really, they become preserved in a self-defense mechanism, which is, to some, some would say, especially Donald Kalsher would say, is a natural built-in property of the soul, or at least of the deep self. I'm going to bring out a quote now starting halfway on the page, but it will all make sense about this idea of self-division. And when a repression occurs, there's a split in the personality and that repressed memory, that difficult memory gets thrust away to the side. And we're talking about these self-divisions now, quoting from the book, Trauma and the Soul. These self-divisions have survival value because they save a part of the child's innocence and aliveness by splitting it off from the rest of the personality, preserving it in the unconscious for possible future growth, and surrounding it with an implicit narrative that is eventually made explicit in dreams. Some unpacking there of what's happening. So firstly, we have this moment of splitting. We have this moment where there's a great wound to our personhood, someone who has power over us doing something which is truly disgusting and unforgivable, or otherwise just very dangerous and very alienating to our sense of being okay in the world and as a little child we don't know what to do with this it gets thrust away some people would say that um if you're more spiritually inclined there are certain guardian angel like figures that appear i don't need to go into that psychology but often many childhood trauma survivors will feel like they had some kind of otherworldly presence that was keeping them safe and there are a few examples throughout this book of very miraculous events and if that's just the imagination of the unconscious mind, that's fantastic. If there is an unseen world of divine protection, then I'm glad that that also exists. I don't know, that's a thought experiment for us to consider. At the very least, there's some kind of force which keeps that pain away so we don't suffer the wound fully. And this is where Donna Kausha then continues that this allows life to go on, quoting now from the book, albeit at a ter terrible price i.e. the loss of animation and vitality that's always been associated with in living. That feeling of passion, that feeling of getting the most out of life, you need to have your soul in your body, or at least have an identity which has a feeling of spirit, a feeling of animation, a feeling of passion to get the most out of this life. And those deep wounds can sometimes create a, a deep crack inside of our soulful cup and it keeps leaking out and that's why at a certain moment later in life we realize that the crack is indeed still there and it's our responsibility to patch things up through the therapeutic approach. Final line now. So ironically the dissociative defense saves a vital core of the self while simultaneously losing it brackets or at least losing it partially. They preserve the seed by cutting it off from the life in this world at least for a time. 
can't cover everything in this video. If you do enjoy Trauma and the Soul, it's a moment where I can invite you over to my Shadow Work library. I've got a specific multi-module curriculum that looks at deep traumas and deep unconscious wounding in regards to shifting you from places of pain into places of self-integration. But this is more of a sensitive video. I'm not trying to sell you on joining my course. It is just genuinely an invitation on a very sensitive topic where there's often not enough good information out there so my shadow work library it's an option but you don't even need to join me on the inside you can watch the shadow work playlist for even more trauma psychology that's linked in the description it's completely free it's about six hours of free content it goes into even more detail about dissociation in particular because in this video now i'm going to shift away from dissociation and more to the idea between the difference of repression and containment which is what's within your control as an adult especially if you've been presented with some painful information when you were a child, you didn't have the skill, you didn't have the emotional capacity, and obviously not the communication skills to be able to truly unpack, identify, or navigate a painful experience in the same way that you can as an adult. You didn't have the support networks, you weren't able to release the charge, you definitely didn't have a therapist, and often if you were in an unsafe environment, the wounds kept compounding over time. Repression was the only option. But now as an adult, you have the ability to contain. And this is where you have the ability to move in and out of the wound again. The archaeologist, not the pirate with the excavator, plundering out, taking too much at once. It's not this extreme situation between all the way buried in your unconscious mind or all the way dug out and brought into light. That's a very extreme way of going about trauma healing. It doesn't work. It's not safe. And also people who do experience emotional dysregulation can often feel like it's only the black or white world of extremes. They feel like if they don't go digging, they'll never get to the bottom of the pain. They'll never know the difference between truth and fantasy. You do have the ability to contain. For me, emotional containment is about having a conscious relationship with difficult emotions where you know that something's happening and you can identify that's a bit too much right now. That's I've got my job. I need to show up for work this week. Something's happening with my family. And I've actually got that thing coming up that I want to look forward to in terms of a social event. I don't, I don't want to lose all of my life to this. I see it's there. You can write it down. You can put it down in the journal. This is where journaling or one-to-one -one work is really useful. You can capture the feeling and capture the essence. Preserve it on a page or have a conversation with your therapist or a counsellor. And make sure that that space is opened, but you don't need to live inside of it. You contain it. You contain the wound in a way where it doesn't bleed out and leak out into all of your psyche. And I know this is easier said than done. If you've just discovered something or you're recently wrestling with a very, very, very challenging and difficult memory, it seems like impossible advice. How can I possibly go on with normal advice when potentially in the worst case scenario, all of my life was a lie. My family member or my friend or that trusted family friend whatever was happening, even if it's an adult trauma, if maybe a moment happened where there was a substance involved on a date and you can't remember the night and it's really difficult and upsetting, obviously it's going to affect you in a deep way. It's very difficult to fully contain, but even if you can just go from it being completely open to having a half containment where you can occasionally do this, you know, windows of opportunity throughout the week where you can still enjoy time with friends and you can contain it there and have a good three hours where you're not thinking about the thing. That's still effective containment and it's not creating a wall. It's not tr trying to crush it. That doesn't work. You're never going to be able to repress in the same way because if we take Donald Kalshed's advice, which he re-emphasizes throughout the book, there's this idea and this is another one of those controversial themes that the adult psyche will self-repair when it's strong enough to be able to handle the wound which it wasn't strong enough to deal with in the first place. It's a radical idea. Why does a certain type of music or a certain film or a certain conversation suddenly trigger the memory of something that happened in the past when it didn't before? You may have listened to the same type of song a hundred times and it's only on that 101st time where it really opens something up Usually it's a pretty positive indication that you're strong as a person. You've got a level of emotional maturity, you've got a level of emotional skill, and a level of safety in your environment that even if it feels like this is the completely worst time for this information to come up, someone like Donald Cowshed, if I'm understanding his points correctly, would say that there's a timing in that. And it might even be more of a soulful timing of there's a deeper 
more intangible, ethereal aspect of our identity that knows when we're strong enough to be able to handle a deep burden, or even the idea that God gives us greater burdens to carry at certain periods in our life, and that could be a memory of what happened deeply in the past, so that we can grow to that next stage of authenticity and character growth overall. Again, that's a deeply philosophical and very theolo theological question. Some people would feel incredibly disvalidated of me saying this right now, because if they're in that immediate moment where today they just learned something, that feels like an absolute, you know, I'm re-repressing them and completely disvalidating the sheer horror of what they just remembered or what they saw, and that feels like the completely wrong narrative. I'm trying to do a lot in a generalized video. What I want you to take with you is that if you're seeing something, it doesn't have to be fully true. We're going to come to this in a moment just to wrap the video up about how to work with themes rather than specifics. But if you're going through that really painful stage, just consider it's because you're strong enough to be able to take this now. Something's changed, you've grown as a person, and you have the emotional resources, even if it doesn't feel like this, to work through the wound and be able to keep excavating the damage in the past, be able to take out the arrow that's been embedded and heal properly. There's always going to be a wound, there's always going to be scar tissue, but you're stronger than you were before. And that's a really hopeful perspective to take with you. No matter what you get from this video, you're stronger than you were before, and you have the resources and the ability to be able to heal this wound repair this relationship with yourself and ideally have more of an insult living where your soul returns back into your body in that full sense of engagement with the world. Final section of the video now trying to do a lot in a single video and it's not fully, I know that when I'm doing this there's a big difference between if you and I were having a conversation one to one where I knew the exact period of time that you are in terms of encountering a repressed memory and your personal emotional capacity, I might miss the mark here or there, but I appreciate you being with me in the conversation. What I want you to take with you as a final takeaway in terms of the practical invitation to go and do both cognitive and somatic therapy work together, working with a therapist or at the very, very, very least getting some of the books I recommend on this channel. There's probably over 250 books recommended on this channel at this point, and again, another open invitation to join me in the shadow work library if you want to focus curriculum where we're looking at trauma work and various aspects of subpersonalities and parts and also moving towards the higher transpersonal vision of deep soul integration and self-integration in the later modules you can find the link in the description an open invitation there's so much for free you can still find on youtube just start doing the general trauma work in terms of inner child somatic therapy self-release cathartic release and also relational repair in terms of attachment wounds I'm going to cover it all now. Just take it very seriously and start investing the time. If you know there's pain, really give yourself the best chance to heal it by bandaging those wounds rather than letting them fester. Final, final section of the video. This is where it really comes down to the how do I know if it's true or not? How do I heal while also not knowing what I'm healing? Going back to the archaeologist metaphor, if you see a small fragment of bone or a fragment of a pot or something that looks like it's a pot you see a little bit of debris in the dust and you've been dusting it away <sighs> don't yank it out just keep uncovering it slowly and you can work with the theme or the idea of what it might be without needing the specific it looks like it's a bone in this case. It looks like it could be a femur bone, but it could be a completely different bone. It could be an entirely different animal. It might not be a dinosaur. It could just be a dog from a hundred years ago. It's a bit of a silly way of seeing it, but that I'm trying to give you something that's imaginative. Same with a piece of pot. Is it is it a piece of pot that was used as a domestic vessel or was it something that was used in more of a ritual situation? We don't know. We don't know until we've found the full picture, but you can work with the essence or the theme without knowing the specifics. If you know that something's happened in the past, and this is where I can't share everything in detail on YouTube because certain topics get censored, but let's imagine there's a deep abuse. There's a deep abuse to your personhood in terms of emotional, physical, or otherwise um, far more destructive abuse of a, a young body. You know what I'm saying, right? If you feel like something like that's happened, I'm not encouraging you to disvalidate that that certain scene or the certain scenes that are coming through really strongly are completely not true, but it's just having that detachment to think, what is the theme here, not the particularity, not the image, but the essence? 
if the image is someone who's bigger and did something which was hurtful, the essence behind there is unsafety, damage, mistrust, and a feeling of violence in the relationship with that particular person. And it really, really, really does depend. It's why I can't give too much in a generalized video. But I've worked with people one-to-one -one where at the start of a mentorship, they were certain that a certain family figure did a certain thing and it was deeply painful. And then three months later, they realized actually, no, that didn't happen. But there's still a deep unsafety. And they always felt a hostile energy coming off the family member. And they were confused in their thinking. And that's for them to decide. I could never, ever make any kind of assumption or assessment it's not my place to say it's nobody's place to say and even if you go into things like hypnotherapy or early age regression it's often a very tricky space to be exploring because an image or an imaginal narrative that comes up is a very natural thing for the unconscious unconscious mind to start presenting and conjuring we work in images and symbols and stories which means that when we're presented with an ambiguous emotion for this case the ambiguous emotion of being unsafe in the pre-memory period from zero to three we might take an image that we've seen elsewhere we might take something from a movie or a song or a story that a friend shared with us and then immediately transplant it because that gap between the certain unsafety but the uncertain specifics gets immediately jumped over. And this is again the issue of emotional dysregulation where it's extremes either way. If you can work with someone over a decently long period of time, at least a few months, and you can really track your moods and track your sensations and work in the uncertain, it might be all of these specifics, but actually the essence and the themes relate to these other areas. And then it's general inner child work and working with general childhood trauma. You've got a lot a lot more that you can do. It'll be difficult at the initial stage because it's often easier to say, oh, this definitely happened this way and my memory must be true. But we know from criminal studies or even eyewitness testimonies that human memory is deeply, deeply faulty. Sometimes people can be completely misgendering, giving the wrong race, giving height differences by a foot, someone was six foot, someone was five foot in terms of crime witnessing and it only happened a few minutes ago. There's so much that happens with human memory that gets completely blocked and distorted and shielded and it's being aware that we, we all suffer from this to some degree. You might be completely on the mark but you may have also shot right past the target and hit a tree off in the distance. That's why it's useful to work with a therapist but what you can do as a final takeaway for the video if you are in the state of repressed memories, that, 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 that sea of intensity and you don't know what to do about calming things down, is that you can honestly, and this is quite the triggering position to be in, I don't know if I should say it, I'm pausing to say it because it's not the right advice to give to someone who's at the early stages. It's a completely wrong advice. I'll do it this way. What I'm about to say is the completely wrong advice and incredibly disvalidating for someone who's in day one, month one, year one, because it's complete repression, not containment. What I would about what I was about to say, and you can see the difficulty again, it's a YouTube video. I can't I can't do everything. It, I don't know you and your specifics. Create a compartment of that happened in the past, and this is the present, and you're safe. See the difficulty there. If someone's experienced a deep wounding and it's in the past and it feels like it's flooding back in with flashbacks and constant waves, that is the completely wrong advice because the past becomes the present with the emotions that are wrapping up and yet at the same time, paradoxically, anchoring yourself in the present, continuing to be engaged with your work, your family relationships, your relationship with your health, your fitness, your body, and your relationship with God and the wider universe, to really focus in on the present and the future can be a space in your psyche that is safe and it doesn't mean that you're not going to go back into the past but it's having a firm distinction if you're if you're in your 20s 30s or 40s and something happened when you were three or four years old it's not happening anymore it's never going to happen again very empowering going back to that moment from about 10 minutes ago where i'm talking about the emotional strength and how the, the psyche presents certain information when we're strong enough to deal with it you also have the strength to be able to compartmentalize and contain again not repress, not hiding away from it, but contain with the intention to enjoy life. And then a couple of times per week with your therapist or with your journal session, I'm going to sit down with that memory again and see what happens. 
that is the long-term process of healing from repressed memories because it does take months and years and especially if there's conversations that need to happen with a mother or a father or a family friend or some kind of confrontation moment where it really feels important for you to have the conversation and really get the truth potentially working through that multi-month timeline and not being too immediate does require an ability to healthily compartmentalize the past the present and the future but it really does depend upon where you are in the timeline you're an adult and you've got autonomy and i want you to use your agency and your own sense of self-healing intuition to know what's the appropriate move you can completely disregard these last few minutes if you're in more of an active flooding um, active kind of flashback stage because that's going to feel like an extra repression and that's definitely not what i'm intending again maybe the fifth time that i've said in this video if there's ever going to be a time where you work with a therapist or a counselor something like this would really be one of those issues they're going to hopefully introduce you to cognitive and somatic therapies that look at a variety of wounds from a variety of different perspectives take away for the video you're emotionally stronger than you might think you are things don't just come up randomly for no reason at all and if you are suffering from dysregulation or feelings of alienation from your body or feelings of disgust feelings of disconnection it is a temporary experience pain does linger and the wounds won't ever fully heal there'll always be a scar if, if something's been remembered and it's true you're always going to have that scar but you can be stronger than your past and you can get through this you can join me in the link in the description to see more videos on this channel related to trauma work in the meantime feel free to share some of your comments down in the comment section i reply to as many of them as i can and maybe we can help each other out and the things that we've learned along the way of how to go from being actively in repression and then moving towards this flashback and flooding and what's worked for you or what you might learn from other people in terms of getting towards a more healthy soulful self-integrated identity i hope this video has been useful again not the full picture it's just a youtube video and this is deeply professional deeply nuanced work but i hope you've enjoyed and i'll see you down in the comment section